Good morning. Is it still morning or is it afternoon? Good afternoon. I, I, I came from Arizona. I have no idea what time it is right now. Um, and uh, I really want to thank Lynn and Brandy and Trisha for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here amongst such wonderful scholars. And, um, and yeah, it, one of the things I, I do have a little bit of a caveat before I start, and, and that is that I do work on black comedy. Um, and in this talk and in, in much of the work on comedy that I do, uh, there will be language that some people will find um, offensive or questionable or have difficulty with on, on a number of levels. Um, I believe in quoting the artist um, and trying to have a, a sense of what the artist was trying to say. Uh, I am not a stand-up comic by training, um, but uh, I hope that I, I do a good enough job in terms of delivering upon what um, these people were trying to say and, um, and hopefully it'll all go well. All right, <laughs> thank you. That, as I said before, um, the, the, the title of my paper is Black Laughter Matters, The Dream Deferred, and Black Comedy in the Age of Obama. And this is a part of a larger work that is becoming larger every day. Um, so you're, I, 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 in the introduction, I told him to tell you this was a short set using the comic vernacular. Um, of what, uh, what this paper is trying to do. So let me just get started with it. In one way or another, I feel I have spent the past 30 years talking about the American dream. Whether as a high school teacher or a media studies professor, the mythologies surrounding the dream have entered my daily discourse. The promise of the possibility that dignity, opportunity, success, and safety are attainable always loomed large, even as it became progressively more out of reach for all too many people living in the, in the United States. Back in 1999, I wrote about the pervasiveness of the dream mythologies in American culture in general, and popular culture specifically, theorizing about how, quote, notions of home in the United States are inextricably tied to constructions of family, nation, and the American dream and how no medium is more responsible for reflecting and refracting those notions than the electronic hearth television, end quote. Well, back then, my words regarding comedy, the dream, and the medium were still jadedly hopeful. Now, it, it's kind of hard to say. After all, at one time, the election and re-election of a black president was seen as the ultimate signifier of acceptance in the American mainstream proof positive that the American dream can come true. Yet one need only to look at who is impacted by most by the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, the born suspect implications of legislation, including Florida's stand your ground law, the mass incarceration of black and brown bodies, and the epidemic of police related and or racially motivated shootings of people of color to see how the promises of the American dream and the elimination of racial inequality remain deferred. In the neoliberal haze of 21st century America, exceptionalism has made a comeback and up by your bootstraps rhetoric continues to inform policy on both sides of the aisle. However, people of color are responding to institutional indifference with grassroots political action, including Black Lives Matter, which has gone from a hashtag to a movement for the men and women whose lives were cut short due to political police brutality, sans accountability, and a justice system whose equal protection is, to say the least, questionable. So to those who want to assert that we live in a post-racial America where the American dream is accessible to all, I say, what about Baltimore, Charleston, Ferguson, Chicago? And what about Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Rakia Boyd, Sandra Bland, and Laquan McDonald? Folks, let me testify for a moment. We have definitely not overcome them. And just to agree with Dave, I'm running out of closet space too. 
While the myth of a post-racial United States has been bandied about since President Obama's election, the post is a point of contention for many blacks, 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 comics included. Just as comedy born of the civil rights struggle of the 60s spoke to the desperate need for social change and recognition, our current socio-historical moment, moment requires that stand-up comedy step up. The consumption of black comedy is often seen as a signifier for downness of a mainstream audience. And today, much of the consumption takes place not in the comedy club, but rather while basking in the hazy light of various small screens. One could also argue that every comic's rise to prominence is actually an American dream story. It's one person, one mic, one individual's commentaries on the human and the American condition. It's, while it may not be the rags to riches story that Horatio Alger had in mind, when did Ragged Dick ever to get to drop the mic? By mapping the landscape of comedic discourse of black comics from the beginning of the first presidential campaign to the waning days of his second term, one sees the difficulty in maintaining what Dick Gregory called comedy's friendly relation in a simultaneously celebratory and infuriating climate in terms of race. The larger work endeavors to look at comics in the context of the age of Obama, as well as the often dry comic discourse dispensed by the commander in chief in order to get to something more complex and speak to change that is a long time coming and has not yet come. The comics selected for today's talk represent different spaces on the spectrum of black comedy in terms of style and substance and their popular cultural prominence is interwoven within the age of Obama from before his first presidential campaign to the waning days of his presidency. And I, I you know, and I wanted to talk about, about Obama in relationship to comedy. Uh, I, some of you might be familiar with this uh, at, his, at the White House Correspondents' Dinner when he um, had Luther Jordan Peele come out and act as his anger translator a bit that they do on Key and Peele. Um, and, and I think it, it's, it's significant in a couple of ways. One, in, in the way that we're actually seeing him relate to um, relate to this discourse that goes on with him having to act a particular way uh, and not show a particular kind of emotion. Um, but also because um, Obama's pretty funny. Um, and and, and I, I say that because not everybody can pull off humor in, in, in within, within these kind of contexts. However, I, I think that what we, we can enjoy or can at least acknowledge is the fact that, um, that Obama does play with humor in ways that a lot of other, other presidents haven't quite done in a public, in a public way. Um, when I decided to call this piece Black Life Matters, I did it with the knowledge that the story I tell here is incomplete. Black comedy is now and has always been part chronicle and part catalyst in black life in the United States. We need to be able to both vent and testify. In this work, I use the ascendancy of Obama and its relationship to black comedy to offer a sample of how this comedy speaks to our hopes for change, but also our exhaustion with the fact that this change has not yet come. Because even at moments when comedy will set us free, the specter of racism is always waiting just out of frame. As the president, perhaps emboldened by his short timer status and his plan, said that his plans included something that rhymes with bucket list at the White House Correspondents' Dinner and as I had mentioned before, with Luther, there were protests taking place less than 50 miles away, calls for justice for Freddie Gray, who died as a result of his spine being broken while in police custody. The words of Langston Hughes in his poem Harlem continue to resonate, particularly the closing lines. Maybe it sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? And in those days that followed, 
the fact that in some private and public spaces, outrage over broken windows was greater than outrage over broken spines, told us we have not yet overcome. When the pictures of victims of a shooting are mug shots or something equally thug inflected, and that of the shooter shows a man in uniform, we have not yet overcome. If as Martin Luther King stated, quote, human salvation lies in the hands of the creatively maladjusted, end quote, then black comedy plays a vital strategic role in getting people to stay woke and vigilant in terms of confronting issues of racism. Whether enunciated from behind the mic at a protest following a police-related shooting in Chicago, on stage for chocolate sundaes at the Laugh Factory in Hollywood, or in the sets of black comics shown on YouTube or HBO, race and racism are topics that are not going away. Now, I wanted to, since I can't obviously talk about all the comics that I, I wanted to deal with in, in this talk, um, I just selected a few and sort of put them within the context of um, the Obama presidency. Uh, when the then junior senator from, from Illinois burst on the national stage with the now famous no red states, no blue states speech at the 2004 Democratic National Convention, Dave Chappelle was basking in the glow of critical and popular acclaim for his stand-up and his brilliantly irreverent and insightful Chappelle show. In 2007, when Barack Hussein Obama was accused of attending a madrasa, a radical Islamist school, um, while living in Indonesia with his mother, uh, although the assertion was proven patently false, it began the strategy of trying to tie the Christian Obama and Islam, um, which has continued throughout his presidency. At, by then, interestingly enough, um, Chappelle had walked away from his universally lauded series and a $50 million payday when he questioned whether the comedy, what his comedy was skewering racial stereotypes or reinforcing them. And um, it, it's also interesting that Chappelle, who is Muslim, um, at, during the, uh, the period that he was supposedly gone and went crazy and all of those things had also gone to Mecca. Um, so it just seemed to have a little bit of a tie there. Um, for Wanda Sykes, uh, an established stand-up comic, comedy writer and go-to BFF, BBF, sorry, black best friend, <laughs> on the big screen and the small screens, the night Obama won was, a highly, was highly emotional, full of joy over the election of the first black president and um, devastation over the passing of Prop, California's Prop 8. Since coming out in response to Prop 8, Sykes has seamlessly incorporated her sexual orientation into the socio-political discourse of her stand-up, whether performing at a gay pride event her HBO special, or at the first White House correspondence dinner of the Obama presidency. During the president's re-election campaign, opposition to Obama was emboldened to mobilize racist words and images, including the don't re in 2012 bumper stickers. While these explicit and implicit threats were being hurled at the president, D.L. Hughley, actor, comic, and one of the kings of comedy, uh, was working as the executive producer and star on D.L. Hughley, The Endangered List, a Peabody Award-winning mockumentary about saving the black man. Hughley's act has always centered on sociopolitical comedy, and he maintains that stand-up comedy is, quote, one of the last places left where people can expect to hear a level of truth, end quote. When President Obama was inaugurated for a second term in 2012, Cat Williams, the fearless and unpredictable, self-proclaimed king of underground comedy, was coming back too from his first retirement with the stand-up comedy movie, Ketpocalypse. Now and then, uh, Williams' act hits upon a wide range of topics across the continuum of socially progressive and socially regressive discourse from black folks' relationship to the president to sexual etiquette. His travails that have been fairly public, um, TMZ seems to be recording his rap sheet. Um, he, his travails have become fodder for his comedy, which has become more self-aware while being no less outrageous. 
And finally, in, in many ways, I think that Hannibal Burris, comic and former television writer, is representative of what many people think of as millennial culture, often associated with the last late stages of Obama's years, of the Obama years. He has a diverse cult following, and his comic cultural critique has his blackness as a narrative given rather than having to be explicitly stated again and again. Um, however, despite all of this, there's one thing that he's known for the most, and uh, one routine for which he's known all over the world, and that'll be examined in depth in just a little bit. What follows is a taste of how the comics reflect upon acting right for us, black America, and for him, the first black president. And I connect acting right here and the American dream in terms of the ways in which we're told, and, 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 and this goes along with something that, that, was, that was dealt with in, in an earlier paper, um, these ideas of behavior, these notions of uplift, and the, these different narratives. And, um, and so I, I, I decided to go with the idea of acting right as one of the ways that, that we do this sort of self-policing. Um, quote, when I was growing up, my mother, she wouldn't even let us dance in the car. A good song would come on the radio and we'd dance and she would stop the car and say, uh, do you want to dance or do you want to ride? Because you ain't dancing in my car. White people are looking at you. She'd turn to look. What? Goddamn, she's right. <laughs> this routine from Wanda Sykes reveals her mother's brand of respectability politics, which can be understood as white people are looking at you. I cannot help but identify with how she internalizes her mother's pragmatic object lesson on race relations. The same message was articulated in my house, but a little bit differently. Don't be typical, my mother would say. The directive being don't act like what they, read white folks, think of as typical or more aptly stereotypical. Talking about black cultural protect production must, all, must include some reflection on the politics of respectability, or as I like to say, acting right. The process of determining what acting right means is as much about how we view as, we'll try that whole sentence again. <laughs> the process of determining what acting right means is as much about how we are viewed in mainstream culture as about how we view ourselves. Object lessons about uplift, the adoption of middle class sensibilities, and the assimilationist desire to get a piece of the American dream can be seen throughout television construction of the super Negro and the super African American, from I Spy to The Cosby Show. On multiple levels, black comedy both critiques and reinforces respectability politics. I would be remiss not to um, deal with this example of a moral and ideological clash informed by notions of acting right. It begins with a cell phone video of Hannibal Burris and the subject was Bill Cosby. He, Cosby gets on, on TV, pull up your plants, black people. I can talk down to you because I had a successful sitcom in the 80s. Yeah, but you rape women, Bill Cosby, so turn the crazy down a couple of notches. When you leave here, Google Bill Cosby rape. That shit gets, has more results than Hannibal Burris. At its best, comedy is a vital tool in pinpointing hypocrisy and skewering authority, moral or otherwise. In this instance, comedy has a tangible impact on popular consciousness. Burris saw the hypocrisy and called it out precisely because Cosby has been decrying the failures, both aspirational and moral, of the black underclass, young black women, and hip hop culture for many years now. This is compounded by the fact that Cosby's comedy has always offered ideological directives privileging the pursuit of a middle-class, uplift-informed American dream. Burris' remark tapped into the anger that Cosby, a comedy icon, had tasked himself with policing how black people should act right when he had not done so himself. Nevertheless, the traces of critique of certain black folks can be found in unlikely places. In his stand-up special, Unapologetic, um, D.L. Hughley 
puts a different spin on categories of blacks proposed by Chris Rock in his famous routine, Niggas versus Black People. I, I assume most people are familiar with, with that. Um, and he explained it in relationship to living while black. Everybody knows that one motherfucker that can only be described as that nigga there, goddamn. Truth is, I know black men and I know niggers and they all have their place. If I'm hanging out at dinner, I like to hang around with black men. But if shit breaks out here tonight, it's a nigger I'm looking for. Hughley's matter of fact statement has a significantly different resonance in differentiating the two groups. Neither group is demonized. Rather, Hughley recognizes difference pragmatically based upon his own life experiences. And he delineates who is a have and who is a have not within the community and how it impacts behaviors and conditions. Thus, Hughley skews and skewers the notion of niggers versus black people. Because if you have one, both in one family, you certainly have both in one community. While this is a complicated issue about which books, articles, and articles have been written and documentaries have been made in relationship to notions of acting right and using the N-word, D.L. Hughley makes a persuasively definitive statement. Quote, the only cool thing about being a black com comedian is you get to say shit other people can't say. That's the only advantage, man. But if y'all want it, we can switch places. We'll rule the world, and you get to say nigger, bitch, and huh. <laughs> the notions of what it means to act right are not created in a vacuum. From these examples of comments engaging this notion, what becomes clear is the multiplicity of ways that these pronouncements about how we perceive ourselves and our behaviors are inflected by how blacks continue to be perceived in the American mainstream. Have things changed in those terms during the Obama years? Wanda Sykes states, first black president, don't have to be so, dig so black all the time. Don't have to be so dignified because we did it. Black folks, we always have to be so dignified because we know if we fuck up, we set everybody back a couple of years. I would argue that despite this accurate assertion, the answer is yes and no particularly if you are the first black president. Acting right, him. In the 21st century, arguably no person has been judged more regarding acting right than President Barack Obama. With the election of Obama, many people thought of him, and this is black, white, brown, etc. many people thought of him as a real magical Negro, not the legend of the beggar Vance variety, the real thing. While all presidents and presidential candidates come under incredible scrutiny, everything about Obama his, and his blackness was fair game. Thus, even during the height of the yes, we can phenomena, there was little that was actually post-racial about the way Obama was viewed in popular consciousness, whether constructed as a threat or a savior. Black comic discourse dealing with Obama is fraught with elation, anxiety, and varying degrees of disillusionment which offers insight into the complexity of the president's relationship with black communities. No doubt expectations were high for the first black president. Unfortunately, much higher than anyone could achieve, particularly when faced with the Great Recession. As Cat Williams said, you have to forgive us for the fact that we voted for a nigga to be a superhero and forgot to ask the nigga, could he fly? After the Bush administration's tainted relationship with black communities due to the epic failures of Hurricane Katrina that made refugees of survivors, a majority of whom were black and poor, the black community was all about change. As D.L. Hughley stated in his 2007 HBO special, it was, about, it was as much about why not him as yes we can in terms of whether the country was ready for a black president. Quote, is the country ready for a black president after the motherfucker we got? Come on now, let's be realistic. How bad could we fuck up? What are we gonna do, steal an election, start a war, and give our friends jobs we know they aren't qualified for? 
Nevertheless, for Obama, the conflation of acting right and acting white, which is after all part of his racial identity as well, was helped and hurt, it helped and hurt his candidacy and presidency, depending upon the constituency. The authenticity of Obama's blackness has been repeatedly questioned both in the media and the black political establishment. Remember in 2007, the black Congressional Black Caucus was leaning towards Hillary Clinton um, as being their candidate. His upbringing, being raised by a white mother and or white grandparents, his Kenyan father who came to the US as a, an immigrant, and the fact that slavery was not part of his familial legacy made some question his empathetic understanding of the black experience. However, during a 2008 interview on 60 Minutes, Obama was asked why he considered himself black when he was raised in a white household. Obama responded that he never had to decide to be black. Quote, I think if you're, you look African-American in this society, you're treated as an African-American in this society. And I think most Americans would agree. In a 2011 performance, Dave Chappelle recounted when he was instructed on how to act right for the greater good from the senator from Illinois. Quote, day before my son's birthday, I got a call. Dave Chappelle, this is Barack Obama. I was starstruck. I was actually amazed, but I didn't act like a bitch. I acted like I expected the call. <laughs> Hello, Senator. We exchanged pleasantries. And then he dropped the heavy on me. Listen, Dave, I need for you to stay out of the public eye for a while. I need for you to stop saying nigger on television so we can make things change." End quote. On one hand, this re routine reflects upon the subversive nature of Chappelle's comedy in general and how it can be mobilized in unforeseen ways. On the other, the fact that he uses his white voice when he speaks as Obama could be seen as questioning the authenticity of the candidate's blackness. Nevertheless, Chappelle stated later in the routine, quote, I voted for, Ob for Barack in Ohio, and I don't usually vote, end quote. While it would be fair to say that black comedy played partisan politics during the Obama administration, just as it had for Bill Clinton, who had been referred to as the b first black president, before the actual black guy came along. Things became more complicated as his tenure in office progressed. Nevertheless, during the early days of Obama's presidency, black comedy often focused on, on the fact that he was our, read black folks, president. For many black comics, there was a degree of defensiveness of, on Obama's behalf, especially when white folks criticized the president for being exactly who they elected him to be. Um, as Cat Williams asserted, you only voted for this nigga because he's kind of a nigga. You w wasn't gonna put no whole nigga in the White House. He's just not strong enough, thank you. Very he's just not strong enough. He never raises his voice. You want him to be a nigga? I don't think you really want him to be a nigga. Obama was, has remained in a precarious position throughout his presidency. If he talked too much about race, he was accused of caring only about black folks. If he didn't, he was accused for, about not caring enough. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry. This has been a constant refrain until recently. On July 22nd, 2015, President Barack Obama recorded one of the most candid interviews of his presidency, and it was with a comic on WTF with Mark Marin. Sitting in Marin's garage in Highland Park, California, Obama discussed race with the white comic. In the most accessible and honest language possible, the president reflected upon how far we have come and how far we have to go. Quote, racism, we're not cured of it. And it's not just a matter of not being polite to say nigger in public. That's not the measure of whether racism still exists or not. It's not just a matter of overt racism. Societies don't overnight completely erase everything that happened 200 to 300 years prior." End quote. Obama's candid assertion proved to be great fodder for the punditry, 
who deliberately focused on the use of the word nigger rather than the context in which it was used. The biting and witty response to this particular round of criticism did not come from a comic behind the mic. Professor uh, Morehouse professor and CNN commentator Mark Lamont Hill did it in a tweet, quote, shout out to the people outraged that the president said nigger once, but don't care about the countless times he's been called it since 08. And finally, um, clearly this discussion needs to extend beyond the self-policing notions related to acting right and to encompass the everyday struggles that go along with the fact that being born black still means being born suspect. And I'm endeavoring to do that in the larger project. But the question I have to ask myself is, am I more jaded than ho hopeful today in terms of the dream? Yes. However, when I watched the President of the United States at the pulpit of the Charleston Emanuel African Methodist Church sing Amazing Grace to end his eulogy for Reverend Clementa Pinckney, the South Carolina state senator and pastor murdered along with eight others by a self-professed white supremacist in the same sanctuary, I felt a connection to the past, present, and future of black life in this country. There are tears and there is laughter. Both give a release and act as a bomb for weary black bodies and souls still waiting for the change that's gonna come. Black comedy is always already a reflection and a refraction of the changing black American condition. Like identity itself, black humor is simultaneously fluid and evolving, resilient and deeply rooted in a history that is still being written. Unfortunately, so is racism. Thank you. It's happening. <laughs> it's happened. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to uh, continue in the many thanks to Trisha Rose, Lynn Joyrich, and Randy Monk Payton, and all of the wonderful staff at both MCM and uh, the CSREA for. Um, for bringing me, for allowing me to present here and um, being wonderful in the process. So um, I guess without further ado, I'm Majda Kargbo and I'm presenting a paper today called Excessive Bodies, Race, Ambivalence, and the Funny Woman. In the pilot episode of The Mindy Project, Dr. Mindy Lahiri, played by Mindy Kaling, <laughs> says, my body mass isn't great, but I'm not like precious or anything. It's a throwaway line, said offhandedly for quick laughs in a moment of frustration after having seen her dream guy marry another woman, Mindy is trying to figure out how she ended up alone once again. As her best friend asks, did you think that he was just gonna ditch the wedding and run, ditch the wedding and run off with you like you're Katherine Heigl? And she replies with perfect comedic timing, kind of, yeah. Although by her own admittance, she isn't a Katherine Heigl type, Mindy is still perplexed because she is highly educated, stylish, and though no Hollywood waif, isn't obese. She has all the other markers of respectability. While, my, my, while a minoritarian subject, she cannot be mistaken for being like precious. Mindy's friend hastens to remind her during this post-breakup tough love session that your life is not a romantic comedy. While this very meta commentary may be true, it doesn't undo the way the show is very explicitly set up as part of the romantic comedy tradition and the limits that this genre imposes both narratively and structurally. 
The opening scene of the pilot is a montage of Lahiri at various ages, young, child, high school student, college freshman, watching romantic comedies, repeating lines that she had clearly learned by heart from repeated viewings. On various television screens, we see scenes so familiar that they instantly inspire a nostalgia and leave an emotional residue for the romantic comedy rhythms of the 80s and 90s. Billy Crystal gesturing towards Meg Ryan as he says, I'll have what she's having. Tom Hanks's Joe Fox expressing to Meg Ryan's Kathleen Kelly that he would like to say, that he would have liked to have said, hey, how about, oh, how about some coffee or, you know, drinks or dinner or a movie for as long as we both shall live in You've Got Mail. And finally, Julia Roberts and Hugh Grant at the height of their most endearing romantic personas as Roberts delivers the line, don't forget I'm just a girl standing in front of boy asking him to love her. And in many ways, the show pays homage to these narratives, right? We're all sort of remembering that moment, like the single tear. And in many ways, the show plays homage to these narrative conventions. Indeed, the conceit of the pilot and of the show more broadly, at least here in the first two seasons, right, is to track the many mishaps that befall Mindy as she waits for this form of romantic relationality to play out, just as she has seen time and again on the silver screen. At the same time, the Mindy Project troubles the audience's expectations of romantic comedy by making visible the artifice of meeting the one, playing with shifting temporalities, and focusing the gaze on a non-white leading lady. When Mindy's life fails to mirror Meg Ryan's or Julia Roberts' on-screen persona, as it of course never can, Dr. Lahiri insists on making reality bend to her romantic longings and reads fate in the mundane, after the opening voiceover film montage, Mindy meets another doctor at her hospital, played by Bill Hader, has, has a forced meet cute, right? This sort of common plot device enabling the first meeting on a film's romantic lead characters in the elevator and promptly falls in love with him. The comedy comes from the way this encounter is not represented as effortless happenstance, as is often the case in the rom-com genre, but rather as very particularly and forcefully manipulated by Mindy herself. At the point of this awkward, one-sided, love at first sight, the sitcom grinds to a halt as a security guard suddenly appears on the screen and says, what does this have to do with the circumstances of your arrest? We have jumped in time to the present day, where Mindy, frazzled and dressed in cocktail attire, tries to explain her actions on the day her former boyfriend, right, Bill Hader, got married to someone else. In her recollection, she gets drunk, makes an inappropriate speech, rides home on her bicycle yelling, I'm Sandra Bullock, and falls into a, into a pool before finally getting arrested for drunken and disorderly conduct. But prior to arrest, and still trying to get her bearings after unexpectedly taking a fully clothed dive into a stranger's backyard pool, Mindy hallucinates that a Barbie doll has come to life and is speaking to her. Carelessly forgotten, one imagines, by a child after a long day of make-believe, Mindy's encounter is much more sobering. The Barbie doll, white and blonde, and with just a tad too much eyeshadow and lipstick verging on the garish, tells Mindy that she needs to get her life together and that at least she, the doll, has a boyfriend. It's a moment simultaneously playful and disturbing. There is a charming unexpectedness to the doll come to life, but also something sinister about this personification of white heteronormative femininity telling Mindy that she isn't quite measuring up. As Janani Subramanian argues, the alternation between flashbacks and the present day, along with tracking shots, underwater shooting, and special effects, right, a Barbie doll with a moving mouth, immediately distinguishes the program as a different kind of situation comedy, one where the situations are not limited by linear narratives and interior sets, and are instead motivated by our heroine's absurd and offbeat mode of comedy. The kind of manic screwball energy infused in these scenes approximates scholar Kathleen Rowe's description of the unruly woman paradigm in female comedy, which suggests that excess of body and behavior is one way that woman as subject can lay claim to her own desire. And of course, the show introduces racial alterity into the normative lead of situation comedies and rom-coms. In The Mindy Project, the object of desire is not Meg Ryan, Julia Roberts, Zoe Deschanel, or Cameron Diaz. 
It's Mindy Kaling, the first South Asian creator, showrunner, and star of her own show. Of course, there's an entirely different legacy, right? I want to acknowledge here of romantic comedy leading ladies one could trace that envision non-heterosexual and or non-white relationalities. I'm thinking here, right, of something new, love and basketball, bend it like Beckham, but I'm a cheerleader to name a few. But to do so would be unfair to the internal narrative structure that the Mindy Project sets up for the viewer. We are going to see an updated modern rom-com translated for the small screen. But what difference does the difference actually make? What effects and affects are produced by having a Barbara Stanwyck-esque screwball comedienne combined with Nora Ephron emotionality embodied by a South Asian leading lady? What we end up with are the limits of representational difference for meaningful critique. Kaling described Dr. Mindy Lahiri's character as potentially politically all over the map on Charlie Rose last year. Rose uh, immediately reads this lack of political stability as a dynamism made possible by Kaling and Lahiri's corporeality. That is, there's something about what her body represents, her race, what he imagines to be her culture and acculturation, her defiant curviness. He asks, quote, is it possible to make her more interesting because she's, he's sort of grasping for words here, because like she has the background she has and looks the way she does. Kaling responds, my character could probably not exist if she wasn't Indian, because if I was being played by, frankly, a thin, beautiful, blonde woman, you might find it incredibly insufferable. But I have the trappings of a marginalized person. And when that person is like decisively saying sort of conservative things and all over the map things, and tellingly, right, Kaling interrupts her line of thought. Another thing about the character, which I love, is she's constantly insisting that she's young and hot to everyone. And she's always saying, like, I'm a smoking hot doctor who makes a lot of money. And she has this confidence that is, like, so delusional, end quote. <laughs> Thus, the Mindy Project posits a world in which minoritarian identification allows one to move freely into the terrain of the taboo, of the knowingly and playfully offensive. There's a certain subversive social currency attached to some bodies. Because Lahiri occupies a marginalized positionality, she is allowed to be naive, a bit delusional, and as recurs throughout the show, blur the lines around racism and racial knowing. The show's subversiveness is supposed to reside in its pastiche, its postmodern mashup of incongruent bodies and ideologies. Dr. Lahiri's misaligned political and ideological statements juxtaposed against her embodiment of racial difference are played for comedic effect. Her libertarian leanings, misidentification of a scarf as a burqa, and comments about race are immediately absorbed into the rom-com expectation of quirkiness. They suddenly become merely endearing and lovable facets of Lahiri in particular and the world of the show more broadly. In short, the show is highly performative. As Judith Butler says, right, we've got to have this moment, this Judith Butler moment. As Judith Butler says of gender, <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to, performativity must be understood not as a singular or deliberate act, but rather as the reiterative and citational practice by which discourse produces the effects that it names. Bodies produce and perform their gender through repeating and imitating norms of clothing, body movement, choices and gesture, action, mannerism, as well as gender roles. They do so in such a way that the discourses and histories that are embedded in them start to seem natural. They are seen to be the truth instead of as actions that have a history. These choices do not just reflect or reveal gender, but rather produce and create it. Nadine Ehlers takes performativity into the realm of race as she posits that, quote, racial performativity always works within and through the modalities of gender and sexuality, and vice versa. And these categories are constituted through one another, end quote. In this sense, neither race nor gender are produced or iterated without also producing their interrelationship. They are, in fact, produced through this interrelationship. This enmeshment of performance, race, and gender becomes a site of productive plurality of Dr. Lahiri, but noticeably does not travel and attach to the bodies of other women of color on the show. This tendency is highlighted by the way the Mindy Project portrays Tamra, the black nurse played by Zosha Rokumor. 
for the majority of her early episodes, Tamara, the only other person of color on the show, there is a, a moment where we've got right a sort of um, ambiguously ethnic uh, side nurse who, or, or sort of front desk person who's only there for a little bit. Um, but for the majority of her early episodes, Tamara, the only other person of color in the show, literally sings and dances as she delivers her lines. The punchline is the excess of her black female embodiment. In the first season, her uh, brief moments of wisdom are always portrayed as a surprising and unexpected dose of rationality. All that we know about her life outside of the office is that she has a boyfriend, Ray Ron, who is coded with all of the stereotypical trappings of black masculinity, except the joke here is that he's actually a white man played by Josh Peck. This, unsurprisingly, uh, led to some critiques of the show's racial politics. The show attempted a response in the second season with an episode entitled, heavily tongue-in-cheek, Mindy Lahiri is a racist. In the episode, written by Ike Barinholtz, who plays Nurse Morgan, and David Stassen, Danny Castellano, Lahiri's love interest, has a patient who tells him she has been singing his praises on her mommy blog. The viewer instantly knows something is a bit off, right, in the way that her comments practically ooze with double entendre, quote, it's so rare to find a practice in Manhattan these days with such a, I don't know, wholesome roster of doctors. Of course, she says as we cut to Tamara and Mindy in a slapstick tableau of half-shaven legs and bruised hips in the bathroom, it's a long story, but it's, you're right. <laughs> I'm not crazy about everyone here, but I guess every place has to have at least one of them, right? Danny Obtusi replies, a mouthy drama queen? Yeah. The episode unfolds as a battle of racial political correctness between Mindy's office, comprised of all white male doctors, with the exception of Lahiri, and the all white male midwife practice on the floor above them, whose racial politics are also rendered comically suspect. The midwives are such self-aware white liberals that they are horrified that Mindy's office refuses to display posters of a black politician who is running for Congress. What's most interesting about this episode, however, is the way it deals with Nurse Tamara. Mindy and Tamara, as our resident persons of color, are tasked with writing a public statement to allay the community's concerns about the practices anti-black politics, which are right, being praised unbeknownst to them by this mommy blog and compounded by their petty refusal to publicly support the black politician. But over dinner, Mindy once again insults Tamara's boyfriend and calls him a deadbeat. Upset, Tamara leaves and joins the midwives. In the end, as all good rom-coms do, the conflict is resolved, but not before Tamara explains that it's not that she thinks Mindy is racist, but rather, quote, you can be condescending to the people under you at work, end quote. In this moment, it becomes not a, um, I'm sorry, wait a minute. Tamara's boyfriend, I'm sorry, I've lost my, in this moment, it becomes not a problem of race, but one of class. Tamara's confession of being made to feel inferior and unimportant are a narrative attempt to solve the subplot of the episode by saying, no, Mindy Lahiri is not a racist. She is just a snob. While there's certainly something refreshing about the show's suggestion that the true problem lies in Mindy's interpersonal failings, it still evades the way in which class and race are deeply entangled in the representations of Dr. Mindy Lahiri. Which brings us back to the opening joke. My body mass isn't great, but I'm not like Precious or anything. What does it mean to not be like Precious? Who, or more precisely, what is Mindy Lahiri positioning herself against? What are the logics that underpin this joke? What racial class and aesthetic categories are being imagined and deployed in this utterance? Precious, of course, is the name of the poor, obese, black character in Sapphire's Push, later adapted by Lee Daniels for the screen in 2009. I begin with this moment of disidentification, not because it is exceptional, um, but because it stages a relationship to the obese black body through the quotidian, banal rhythms of a half-hour comedy. That is to say, there is, a there is a casual expectedness of this sort of comment, a cultural shorthand that ostensibly needs no expanded context for the joke to land because of what precious stands in for in the cultural imaginary. And although Mindy Kaling's social media presence would suggest that she is not an advocate of body shaming generally, right, the precious reference works precisely because of the way the character is conflated with the actress. The humor of the joke, 
resides presumably in the contrast between Mindy, Lahiri, and Kaling, and Precious. That is, Precious is representative of unruly blackness, and she is invoked in order to highlight the starkly different nexus of racial, cultural, and social relations that both of these marked bodies inhabit. Mindy, although um, not the conventionally slender Hollywood figure, is not obese. She consistently and only dates white men on the show and is firmly positioned in the upper middle class. Precious, on the other hand, is, as David Edelstein wrote in a review, quote, the embodiment of everything, I mean everything, American society values least and victimizes most. She's a poor, illiterate, morbidly obese, dark-skinned African-American girl. Thus, the joke on the excessiveness of Precious's body Thus, the joke relies on the excessiveness of Precious's body, right? That is the joke. Indeed, the reference recalls the film's initial reception, which focused on Gabourey Sidibe's body, alternating between awe at this newcomer's deft performance and lightly veiled repulsion of Sidibe's Precious's body. Most reviews and articles could not comment on the film without sensationalizing Sidibe's corpulence. Anthony Lane wrote in the New York in the New Yorker that Sidibe is grimly overweight, her face so filled out that the play of normal expression seems restricted. Another reviewer calls her mountainously obese. A.O. Scott followed a similar line in the New York Times when he called Precious's massive body at once a prison and a hiding place, adding with an unclear mixture of compassion and disdain that Sidibe seems, quote, inarticulate and emotionally shut down. And in New York Magazine, David Edelstein remarked hatefully that the actor's head is like, quote, a balloon on the body of a zeppelin, her cheeks so inflated they squash her eyes into slits. Edelstein echoes Lane's assumption that normal expression is debilitated by fatness when he writes the city Bay's expression is either, sh is either surly or unreadable, that even with her voiceover narration, you're meant to stare at her ebony face and see nothing. I draw attention to the discourse circulating around Precious's and Sidibe's body because they are important parallels to the ways black, unruly corpulence is imagined in these reviews and the way that the specter of racialized corpulence haunts the margins of the Mindy Project. As the Times critic Hirschberg suggests, the problem of Precious is the initial feeling of repulsion felt by some viewers that eventually, slowly, shifts into an uneasy form of identification. It is an identification that has to be earned, and even then, it is partial and always tenuous precisely because of Precious's abject racial and sociocultural position. In addition to her corpulence, Precious is distanced from her viewer sartorially. Her clothing, nondescript hoodies, t-shirts, and jeans are not merely markers of her class, but of her inability to approximate normative beauty standards and therefore be fully included in the social body. The Mindy Project, very carefully manages Mindy Lahiri's visibility so that, ab so that the absence of identificatory capacity that manifested, as the sort of reviewer says, in the audience reception of Precious is not replicated, right? We don't want, we don't want there a feeling of distance to happen here where, when her non-white, non-Hollywood thin body is on display. That is to say, the show constructs Precious both metaphorically and literally as the limits of the transgressive possibilities of the unruly, marginalized body of color. This is made even more explicit in a, um, re in a recent episode from season three entitled, What to Expect When You're Expanding. In this episode, Mindy seems to have run out of um, her seemingly bottomless confidence that infuses every facet of the show. As her pregnancy makes her insecure about her looks, she vocalizes everything she's afraid of, that she'll never lose those last few pounds, that Danny will just get better looking. To help Mindy out of this rut, which manifests most visibly in her resorting to baggy track suits in lieu of her usually very colorful and form-fitting ensembles, Tamara's cousin Sheena, played by guest star Laverne Cox of Orange is the New Black fame, gives her a competence pep talk um, and makeover. Speaking in a nondescript yet universal urban mashup of every sassy black best friend sidekick, Sheena's excess is presented as normative precisely because of how her body is racially marked. 
She wears large hoop earrings, commonly known right as door knockers, and a brightly printed romper with a belted gold chain. Lest the intent of Sheena's ghetto fabulousness be lost on the viewer, the makeover she gives Mindy results not in a return to her usual beautiful, perfectly curated outfits, but rather in Mindy getting her own pair of door knockers, albeit slightly smaller, and being dressed in a skin-tight bodysuit with gold lame accents and gold chain accessories. Notably, sites like the Mindy Project Style and Worn on TV, which closely track all the outfits worn on the show by Kaling and find their real life versions or their closest approximation so that like fangirls can buy the outfits, did not bother with this. They didn't bother with this particular ensemble. This comically urbanizing presence of Sheena's excess is further emphasized when at the end of the episode, Mindy says, quote, I like how urban you're being right now after Danny, having been trained by cousin Sheena, Laverne Cox, on how to properly treat a woman says, a real man makes his woman feel beautiful. In many ways, Kaling writing herself as a romantic comedy heroine with a string of white male love interests is a radical act. <laughs> Mindy's brown skin and self-declared chubbiness recalls Linda Mizajewski's analysis of Queen Latifah in the comedy Bringing Down the House. The excessiveness of this heroine is prescribed by the cultural ideals of white femininity, which in turn is pictured through very select bodies. However, I contend that Mindy's comedic unruliness is very carefully policed and, in fact, depends upon conjuring up and then disavowing the truly excessive embodiment that Sidibe as Precious and later Cox as Sheena represents. On the one hand, Mindy is the perfect post-feminist subject, as Angela McRobbie would call her. She is educated, professional, and possesses the means to lead an independent life full of exciting choices and these choices are negotiated along predominantly heterosexual upper class and consumer oriented lines. It is believable because as media scholarship Ladave argues, in popular culture, South Asians are associated with privilege and success within American racial paradigms. On the, on the other hand, Mindy's privilege as a post-feminist romantic comedy heroine mitigates her brownness as her body size, her clothing, her comfortable lifestyle, and her similarly privileged friends and coworkers construct her as the right kind of subject who can make the right kind of choices. Because a character is embedded in a genre that carefully regulates the kinds of attachments, affects, and relationalities excess is allowed to produce. The Mindy Project imagines new possibilities for the curvy, irreverent, brown body. It is a text intentionally rife with contradictions, ambivalence, and blurry intentions. The Mindy Project um, intentionally and often uproariously blurs the lines between expectations and of authenticity and the performance of reality. It uses genre hybridity, fluctuating affect, and exaggerated performance to disrupt the normative logics attached to South Asian bodies. But the possibilities it offers are not without limits, and that limit is repeatedly the black female body. These possibilities are carefully regulated through the figures of black womanhood, briefly glimpsed in the peripheral and loosely sketched um, I'm sorry, let me repeat that. These possibilities are carefully regulated through the figures of black womanhood briefly glimpsed in the peripheral and loosely sketched Tamara, the strategic deployment of Laverne Cox as Sheena, and the invocation of Precious. These unruly bodies are put to use, but unlike Dr. Mindy Lahiri, are not allowed to tarry for too long. Thus, I end with this image of a glamorous precious, a precious who forces us to contend with how difficult it is to be trapped in a body that looks like pain, that looks like a wanting never fulfilled, who is also not a Katherine Heigl type. Thank you.
Oh, th th first, thank you, Lynn, uh, Brandy, Professor Rose, and uh, everyone at the CS Rare for the invitation. I'm excited to be here. Um, <clears throat> Mariah Carey is one of the most uh, commercially successful recording artists in music history. She remains the best-selling female artist of the SoundScan era and has achieved, as of 2008, more number one hits than Elvis <coughs> Presley, making her the solo artist with the most number ones in the United States. Yet she has rarely been the subject of critical attention. Some critics have studied her voice, which is a key aspect of her, of her celebrity, as a way of approaching black aesthetics and popular balladry. More recently, there have been essays on her status as a mixed race celebrity. But as the critic Jason King argues, the aesthetics of the major 20th century black pop artists, among which he includes Diana Ross, Michael Jackson, and Carrie, have not received substantive academic attention because, he contends, they are too overtly enmeshed with schmaltz and spectacle. I would add that neither Ross nor Jackson have consistently engaged with camp, kitsch, or cuteness in the profoundly disruptive mode of Carrie, who has equaled and in some aspects surpassed their commercial success through her use of kitschy aesthetics, particularly in her music video and visual cultural modes. Whether it is her infamous breakdown on TRL, her appearance on MTV's Cribs, or her music video persona more generally, Mariah Carey is a complex, disruptive figure. She has never achieved the level of racialized gendered respectability or iconicity, the ability to stand in for racial achievement and transcendence of other pop divas of color, like Whitney Houston during her live televised Star Spangled Banner performance, or by Beyonce more generally. The conventional critical narrative about Carrie's career argues that there are two phases to her trajectory, before and after a hip hop turn. The first phase is usually referred to as her ballad queen period, when she was portrayed through demure video imagery that emphasized um, a kind of old school R&B sensibility. She then incorporated rappers into her music and this became linked to a kind of racialized gendered sexual graphicness or realness. While she was critiqued for being too white and thus fake before her hip hop turn, she was then critiqued for being too black and thus fake after the hip hop turn. In this talk, I reject these racialized gendered logics of fakeness and authenticity because Carrie's own kitschy theatrics in her music videos question such binaries. Yet critics have noted Mariah's kitschy qualities only to dismiss her as fake or inauthentic or insincere. Just to give some background on kitsch, the word emerges in Germany as a way of denoting the kind of trashy tchotchkes that American tourists understood as European art which highlights the sort of national ethnic implications of the word's associations with uh, fakeness. Kitsch was an inauthentic misrepresentation of a country's art. In many ways, the US denigration of Carrie's work as kitsch can be linked to its denigration as racially inauthentic. As a biracial subject, her mother is Irish American and her father is black and Afro-Venezuelan, <coughs> Carrie undoes the black-white oppositions that structure US cultures, and so she is often cast as a kind of suburban racial tourist exploring the American versions of Afro-diasporic forms. Critics have used terms like mall burby of blandness to refer to her music, or they say that her music sounds like a shopping mall. Even Madonna, uh, told Spin Magazine that, quote, the same country that makes a piece of shit movie number one buys Mariah Carey records. It's this homogeneity, but it has nothing to do with art. This idea of suburban mass homogeneity and inauthenticity is linked to Carey's performance of racialized femininity. Many critics see Mariah's campy approach to race as a capitulation to commercial forces. Further, they read her engagements with racial and sexual normativities through heteronormative assumptions about race, gender, and sexuality. For example, an Esquire writer criticized what he termed the, quote, pornification of the late 90s teen pop boom by christening it the butterfly effect after Mariah's music videos post the butterfly album. A critic from The Onion referred to that moment as Carrie's hoification. These lurid and putative terms suggest the masculinism that undergirds many of the engagements with Carrie's imagery, and also the ways in which racialized femininities are made to stand in for the corporeal or pornographic excess of pop televisualities. Yet feminist critics have also misread Carrie by interpreting her iconography straight. 
For example, the scholar of mixed race femininity, Sika Dekbavi Mullins, argues that Mariah turned herself into an object of heterosexual fantasy by cultivating, quote, a multiracial Barbie image, slightly a superficially other, yet ultimately a cheap replication of whiteness, end quote. I contend that Carrie's cultivation of Barbie doll aesthetics is actually an important negotiation of racial performance. I want to focus on how her playful, kitschy, and girlish performances queer conventional aesthetic boundaries across race, gender, and sexuality. In order to do that, I want to foreground an important concept for understanding Carrie's aesthetic, which is the notion of racial innocence. In her work on racial innocence, Robin Bernstein demonstrates how the invention of childhood as a site of innocence in the US was a profoundly racialized project. Indeed, Bernstein argues that until the civil rights movement, the very notion of childhood came to stand in for a naturalized link between whiteness and innocence. Carrie has described her own childhood and the confusions she evoked as a mixed race child with a black father and white mother in the Long Island suburbs. She has specifically evoked how she was forced to see herself through white adult eyes as a disturbing figure rather than an innocent child. Quote, I remember being with my father and people looking at him like, did you kidnap this kid or something? And being with my mother and people looking at us and thinking, why does she look darker? Why does she look more ethnic? End quote. While I don't want to reduce Carrie's work to her biography, I think her statement gives us important context for considering the cultural work contesting the association of racial innocence with whiteness. One of the key moments for understanding Carrie's complex negotiations of innocence is through her music video performances accompanying the albums usually understood as her least successful moments, both commercially and aesthetically, Rainbow and Glitter. Their very titles gesture to a kind of pre-adolescent femininity, and this period is framed as the moment when Carrie lost her balance between teen pop innocence and hip hop realness. Instead, I understand this moment as one in which Carrie demonstrate how, as Hiram Perez notes, there is, quote, something awfully queer about hybridity. Mm -hmm. I want to just uh, quickly show the cover of Rainbow, who's photographed by the queer photographer turned music video director David LaChapelle, who was an Andy Warhol mentee at Interview Magazine. Um, I might briefly note the use of the, of the hip hop form of graffiti to signify the queerness and racial implications of the rainbow symbol, one of the many ways in which Mariah has queered hip hop culture. Uh, critics note that La Chapelle's kitsch pop surrealism uses the erotic to liberate the representation of the female body from a pornographic context. Like La Chapelle, Carrie seeks to contest the association of the racialized feminine body with perversity or sexual realness. Critics have also noted that La Chapelle's work is interspersed with humor and at times even irony, but it is entirely devoid of cynicism. I think this conceptualization of humor and irony without cynicism perfectly captures the effective disposition of Carrie's modes of surreal juxtapositions in her video's theatrics. In fact, I argue Carrie's use of irony without cynicism is one of the reasons why her art is denigrated as suburban. In Karen Tongson's work on the way queers of color negotiate suburban imaginaries, she notes that the work of irony and humor in postmodern avant-garde productions is meant to create a kind of ironic distancing. In other words, the artist sets her or himself apart as a more knowing subject than the masses. In contrast, irony in these queer of color suburban productions is meant to create new affinities, socialities, and convivialities in contested mixed race spaces. This conviviality is created through humor that the performer is a part of. I contend that in the music video for Lover Boy, the infamous Glitter album's flop lead single, Carrie collaborates with La Chapelle to create new queer affinities and convivialities through non-cynical humor. As you're about to see in the video, Carrie performs a kind of girlish unknowingness about her sexual appeal, even as she presents her body in a, in a graphic or highly detailed manner that highlights body parts in a potentially erotic way. The uniformity of, of this performance across different video directors throughout Carrie's career, uh, ranging from the video for Heartbreaker to her latest video for the single Beautiful, suggests that she is the auteur of this gestural repertoire. I just wanna quickly show a scene from the
Look for when she says uh, real shy. <laughs> so, I mean, first, actually, as a brief, um, since we're talking about television, as a brief aside, I want to point out that <laughs> Carrie's televisual affinities with drag queens and queers of color, as I think that the the a video for Lover Boys, you saw the fuchsia sort of drag race thing, um, inspired the opening for RuPaul's Drag Race, which came out eight years later because RuPaul, like all queers of good, bad taste, is a careful student of Carrie's glamour. <laughs> uh, the Lover Boy video is set at a car race and a car show. These have traditionally been settings of great camp potential because of their anachronistic associations with 1950s uh, white, white innocence and Americana, as demonstrated, for example, by John Waters' use of the car show in his film Hairspray. In that film, the car show becomes a site for linking Tracy Turnblad's plus-size embodiment to the normative glamour and trashy aspiration of being a car show girl. <laughs> that role of white femininity itself gestures to the way mechanical and feminine bodies are both technologies <coughs> of desire and commodification. This analogy between feminine embodiment, automotive technology, and Americana is made explicit in the video in shots that include Carrie's breasts encased in an American flag bikini seemingly floating around the video surrounded by hubcaps, pointing to the way Carrie's breasts, like hubcaps, are objectified and sold as parts. Importantly, when Carrie performs the lyric, even though I'm real shy, which we just saw, she quickly grabs her breast and the tiny bandana top and giggles at the camera, making innocent this performance of unselfconscious shyness, even while singing about shyness. We might understand the work of Carrie's giggle, smiles, and happiness as a performance of humorous self-pleasure in which she is both humorous object and subject in the mode of the queer of color suburban aesthetics I previously mentioned. The critical tendency around Carrie is to collapse her video persona with her real life performance and dismiss her as a smiling automaton. Critic Ann Powers, for example, says that her smile is as rote as those, as those of the 1940s pinups she emulates. In contrast, I argue Carrie's performance of fun, or as she calls it, being festive, <laughs> is part of her negotiations of what we might call her aesthetic of ass cheeks graphicness innocence. Ass cheeks is her term, as we'll see. She uses giggles and laughter partly as a way of campily breaking up the potential heterosexual seriousness of what two hairpin, hairpin critics term in celebratory fashion her tits and ass vulgarity. The invocation of 1940s pinups should remind us that Carrie has always emphasized her connection to an identification with Marilyn Monroe, who famously created a performance that combined non-knowingness and erotic re uh, revelation. This is perhaps most famously invoked with the now iconic scene of her skirt flying up on the subway grate as Mon Monroe giggles girlishly, which was originally a scene for the seven year itch. Through her later career, Carrie has sought to perform in this tradition of white feminized non-knowingness, even though as a mixed race woman, she cannot and has not been understood in the same way. However, through her music video, Tits and Ass Persona, Carrie stages the innocence and girlishness of not knowing, of not noticing the potentially erotic readings of her racialized gendered graphicness. She thus manages to convey a relationship to vulgarity and trashiness that negotiates between overtly, to use Mariah's word, announcing herself as perverse and the opposite of such overtness, which would be concealment, suppression, or adhering to a kind of respectability. In the aftermath of the revelation of her ass cheeks in the Loverboy video, Carrie explained, quote, I don't think the short shorts are a problem. I'm not against ass cheeks, end quote. <laughs> this ambiguous, doubly negating announcement of not against ass cheeks, as opposed to a more directly political statement like I'm for ass cheeks, is itself an intriguingly <laughs> ambivalent and indirect formulation, a critical in-betweenness that mimics Carrie's performance of in-betweenness among the norms of race gender, and sexuality. This in-betweenness has made it difficult for feminists and feminists of color to claim Carrie. In her exploration of Rihanna's ability to use and redeploy the scandal of Chris Brown's violence against her uh, to her advantage as a pop diva in both music videos and her public narrative, Nicole Fleetwood notes that Rihanna's exploitation of a configuration of black feminine eroticism with violence is one that she doesn't condone, but that she considers it epistemologically important to move away from protectionist modes of critique that have hampered black feminist analysis. 
Similarly, Carrie's combination of ass cheeks graphicness with innocence and whimsy is a transgressive configuration that requires analysis rather than moralistic condemnation. Rather than thinking of Carrie as producing a cheap replication of whiteness, as the previous critics argued, I posit she performs a revaluation of the class racialized gendered cheapness of booty shorts and the graphicness of nudity, not through positive images, but through complex imagery that attempts to grapple with the binaries that place blackness, realness, sexualized embodiment on one side, and whiteness, childhood innocence, and whimsy on the other. I want to end by quickly turning to one of the most brilliant parodies and theorizations of Mariah's uh, gestural repertoire ever, um, which is uh, Deborah Wilson's Mad TV parody. <laughs> Actually, it's interesting that everyone's laughing. I mean, we, we can talk about what we're laughing about. Um, the parody mocks Carrie's aesthetic of ass cheeks graphicness and innocence in a mode that suggests that the joke is at her expense. It shows Deborah Wilson as Carrie uh, performing oral sex on the rapper Snoop Dogg and Missy Elliott, arguably implying that Carrie's disruption of the binaries between pop and hip hop has occurred through an embodied sexual availability rather than through her brilliantly kitschy reconfigurations of the fantasies that circulate around her embodiment and sexual persona. At the end of the parody, uh, which I don't have to, time to fully unpack because it mocks not just the video, but its reception by white teenagers on TRL, uh, Deborah Wilson as Carrie explains, as you saw, hi, I'm Mariah, I'm from Mars, um, and I requested Love Muffin so I could say I'm not crazy, and then proceeds to act crazy by singing gibberish off key. Um, but as I have been arguing, right, Carrie's video theatrics function through a kind of unknowingness about her racialized gendered erotics. Yet the joke here lies in part in having Carrie finally perform an epistemological confession in which she acknowledges the supposed alienation, otherworldliness, and irrationality or craziness of her surreal juxtapositions. This suggests in part why her alleged breakdown in 2001 got so much coverage. As we see in this TRL video parody from three years before her infamous 2001 TRL appearance, her breakdown of racialized gendered binaries already circulated through ideas about her supposed irrationality. I contend instead that Carrie's campy disruptions of the innocent and graphic, serious and unserious, real and fake, girlish and sexual, authentic and inauthentic, queer and straight, and perhaps most importantly, black and white, have performed important cultural work. Through her humorous theatrics, Carrie remixed the racialized gendered margins. Sorry. Just going back here. Through her humorous theatrics, Carrie remixed the racialized gendered uh, margins and centers of pop music, profoundly changing American culture. Carrie's aesthetic paved the way for current pop divas like Beyonce, whose video persona effortlessly combines hip hop realness with pop diva glamour, to Katy Perry, who recently paid homage to Carrie's camp music video theatrics in her own music video for This Is How We Do. But perhaps most importantly, Carrie's music video theatrics enabled new convivialities that opened up a space for queerly racialized subjects to be in on the joke. We might say she queerly racializes the American dream. <laughs> 